morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? I, I trust you would have gotten your invitation. It's, um, uh, I hope it's a signal of, of how we do things in Ansari Canaries, the appropriate way. So we thought it's only fitting that we officially invite you to our activity on the 23rd of February. Um, I expect you to come not only with your cameras, but also with your wallet. Because I expect you to spend as much of your hard-earned um, income as possible. I thought we were getting free love. Yeah, I, I, I just thought they were getting free love. Free what? <laughs> and free lobster. Well, sorry. You, you, should, you should direct your request to the, yeah, to the press secretary. You should invites, right? <laughs> direct those requests to the um, press okay. secretary, and then we'll see if we could... Uh, well, if we could. Well, when you get, get fancy well, invites like that, right? you expect to see... <laughs> Fancy because we appreciate you know we have we have we have a, a point to prove we 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 are very serious about our business in Ansari Canaries, and despite all the sort of references to us, um, I think again we are demonstrating that we are very serious about about our our agenda going forward. So on Friday the twenty third we'll be relaunching the fish fry. As you know, it has been um, it has been um, on a bit of a break for some time. Um, there were some challenges with the way it was operated previously, and we wanted to make the point that this time around we do it correctly. So we train, we spend time training the vendors in various aspects. Um, we also got them to appreciate that um, for this activity to survive, we need to be mindful as to how we treat our customers, whether it is foreigners or locals, and the pricing. Um, we also want to add a bit of culture um, to that. Um, as you know, Grosley also happens on a Friday night. Um, so we need to find ways to differentiate ourselves. So we are also in the process of renovating a building which will be used as a theater. So when you come to answer on a Friday, you could take in a bit of a show and then wander off to get your food afterwards in the village of Ansley. So it's a really a holistic approach in terms of what we're trying to, what we're trying to achieve. Um, at this point, I really want to thank the Community Tourism Agency. Um, they have been very, very supportive. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, all of this lovely um, invitation, all of that wonderful stuff you have came out of Community Tourism Agency. Again, it is, it is, the, it is again the, the, the significance of the activity and what it means to us in the community. So I look forward to seeing all of you with your cameras and your wallets on Friday the 23rd. Thank you very, very, very much. Any questions? You said about the community getting involved. Mm -hmm. Would there be some cultural display? Yes, cultural yes. Display. Correct, correct. We have, we have culture, we have art, we have entertainment, we have, we have um, uh, the tastiest fish you will get on the island, actually. Um, I know somebody else will come very shortly and say, their fish is better than mine, but I think I think we've um, I think we will demonstrate that our cuisine is is better on the coast than in the north. <laughs> well, when you spoke about um, the fact that grocery also has it on Friday night, yes. um, I, I'm not too sure if there there will be any plans to I don't know maybe change the day. Is is it is that um, probably not necessary change the day? But what we think we should do is to differentiate ourselves. So as I was making the point, um, what we want to do is. Um, at the moment, you go to Grosley on a Friday, just a street jam, you lie. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is, because we have so much talent in Ansari Canaries, in particular Ansari, we would be putting on theoretical um, displays. So you could come catch a show, whether it is 5 US, 10 US, the price is still not confirmed as yet. You will take in a show, and then after you've taken the show, you then wander off into the village to have a meal. So hopefully that will differentiate us from Grosley. Um, there's nothing wrong with going to Grosley after you spend your money in Ansari Canaries. Um, but, <laughs> but I'd appreciate if you come down to Ansari first, take in a show, enjoy our cuisine, our culture, and then wander off to Grosley as you make your way home. But make sure you spend most of your money in Ansari before you leave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the jetty, correct, correct. So as you know, we've just completed work on the jetty. Um, we are also, we're just waiting for um, the, um, some final bits to allow for the bigger vessels to moor on the jetty. But insofar as whether or not you come on a small vessel, we will arrange to get you, to get you on the shore. So yes, we expect you to come by land, by sea. Um, um, yes. Yes? 
So thank you very much again for your patience and your, um, and your, your time. And remember, come with your wallet and your camera, not just your cameras, please. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Okay, so the joy from this year. Yes. As the as the minister of finance, how is the budget of me is going, and what are some of the things that you are seeing? Yes. So th a good question. So we are in the process of finalizing the budget. Um, you you would have recognized when we got into government as of December 2021, the debt to GDP ratio was in excess of 100 percent. So we've spent the last few years making sure that we bring it down to prudential limits. Now, we, we've given a commitment, us in the OECS, ECCU, that will be 60% by 2035. Uh, we're just above 75% at the moment, and we are trending downwards. Uh, this year, there will be no new taxes. Um, we intend to put a lot more money into the social aspects of things, because we recognize that there are some challenges coming out of, of COVID and how things were done. So we are uh, increasing that amount of money available to the social um, infrastructure. Um, we are um, placing further emphasis on youth, sports, education, and indeed health. Um, we think it will be a very, a very um, interesting budget. There are things in my constituency that I can't wait to announce. Um, and I think the Prime Minister, the Minister of Finance, has done very well in getting us to this point where we are at the moment. In a few weeks' time, when we unveil the budget, we realize, based on the metrics, uh, that we have done very well, considering where we started off in 2021. There have been concerns that you did mention that there are no new taxes, let's say, but yet uh, the two point thing has been improved. People are concerned and saying that it is a top form of tax. Well, you see, and, and I think when we're having this conversation, we need to be very, very clear. If we want to see better outcomes in health, the metric is you spend 6% of your GDP on health. At the moment, we are spending just be below 4% and we're trying to progress to 6%. The truth of the matter is, if we want better outcomes in healthcare, we need to be able to raise more revenue. The health and security levy was a way of us doing it to not allow everybody, because there's some people who certainly can't afford um, to pay um, for their medical services. We live in a society where we should share the responsibility. The 2.5 levy is simply an attempt to bring forward more funding for the health sector and, of course, security. Because we are, um, at the moment, not spending what we're supposed to be spending on health. As I was saying before, the guideline is 6% of GDP. We're not anywhere near that at the moment. And in that regard, so the United Post Party has concerned saying that the levy is actually a loan to a loan. What do you say to this? I'm not too sure if, if, if the United Workers Party is saying that it's a loan, perhaps they should return to the textbook. Because I'm not too sure. No, they didn't say it's a loan. Um, one of the um, requirements mm -hmm. for the policy based loan that you would have acquired from yes. the World Bank, yes. as I said, that this was one of the requirements of the World Bank for you to get that loan. The implementation of this levy to raise more revenue. Yes. Well, actually, the policy based loan was a discussion that took place before we got into government. Um, and at that time, the World Bank would not have known, although the previous government did make an attempt to have a, a health and security levy, a security levy. Um, but the World Bank at that time would not have known our intent to have a health and security levy. So that was not part of the policy-based loan. Um, so I'm not quite sure. The Prime Minister did mention in his um, yes. opening statement yes. um, last week uh, that there were um, requirements yes. of the World Bank, yes. and then he, he, he spoke of them, and he spoke of the health and security yes. levy yes. as one of them, including increasing excise tax on tobacco and some other Correct. things that were needed. Correct. So he Correct. did mention it. Yeah, So, but he would have mentioned it, and I, and I saw his statement, he would have mentioned it in the sense of the, the challenges we face as a government in terms of dealing with those institutions. Um, they usually prescribe certain measures for you to adopt. Some of them we, we have a choice, some of them we don't have a choice. They did ask us to do even further to bring, that in our minds would bring hardship to those who are already having the most difficult time. So the reason why he would have suggested or he would have been happy to go with the 2.5 levy, because it allows us to um, not have a blanket, because the 2.5 levy does not apply to matters or products or groceries. Um, it would not apply to that. But if we went with a straight increase of the VAT, then everyone would be paying. So we thought rather than have everyone paying and giving those who are already in a difficult situation even more difficulty, we thought the levy would be more, more, more strategic insofar as 
how we how we how we deal with the revenue. You said that you decided to go with yes. This yep. Of the that, yep. Yep. So it was part of the requirements to obtain that loan. Then the increase in revenue was part of the requirements of the World Bank. So you allowed them to choose how you would increase your No, the Prime Minister was very firm in so far as how he would approach it. Um, they would suggest to you you do A, B, C, D, E. It is left to the Prime Minister to decide. Well, um, this is this is how I think I should approach it on behalf of the citizens who put me in government. So yes, the question of revenue was raised, um, but that is one of the, one of the, uh, the options we, we decided to go for, as opposed to the, the general increase in, in the VAT. But wouldn't you say, as someone in finance, um, that increasing the, the well, increasing basically the, the cost of, of goods, especially because the, the levy is on the importation of goods and, and, and services as well. This would ultimately increase the price of groceries because of the entities that do sell it, what they're importing other things, they have to do other things. So obviously they pass on the cost to their, their, their customers. So we did see issues, we did see increase in prices, we did see it. I mean, commerce did get the complaints, they did investigate. So ultimately there was an increase. But I'm not too sure if the increase was, was necessarily as a result of the levy. Um, you must appreciate um, um, uh, business people will, will obviously try to maximize profit. I'm not too sure if the increases in the cost of living was necessary because of the levy. You would have appreciated that there was an issue with, with um, inflation. There was an issue in so far as the supply chain. So there are other factors which would have accounted for the increase in the cost of living. But the very same people that we were trying to protect, remember, they are not in that bracket insofar as, because the items that they most readily get access to, no health and security levy, and no VAT, because they are exempt items. So the concern that you have about those particular individuals, they were not the ones who were going to suffer from this particular point. But I agree with you, it's a shared sacrifice. I have to pay more when I go to the supermarket, but it's not necessarily because it is the health and, se health and security levy. Yeah, but we have companies like KFC who sent out a note telling people that your delivery cost has increased again because of the health and security levy. Yes, so yes. All, all of these things, in, in essentially it does because if, for example, Digicel increases the cost, right, the cost of your bill, you as a company, let's say Massey, and yes, you're getting yes. services from Digicel, yes. if Digicel increases, you're going to pass on the cost always. So, but is it is it is it always cost? clear? Is it always clear that the reason why they're raising their prices is because of the? That's the point. So there's no way for us to pinpoint and say definitely this is as a result of the health and security levy. A businessman will profit any opportunity he gets to have better profits. Um, the question is, what are we saying about that to them as a society? Mm -hmm. I, I was just in Saint Kitts recently, um, and there's a smaller population in Saint Kitts. But when I went to the supermarket specifically to have a look, realizing that some of the prices are as, as much as half the cost in St. Lucia. So a serious conversation needs to be had. And I know the Minister of Commerce is in the process of having that conversation. Insofar as what are we paying for our prices on the, on the shelf? Because St. Kitts has a smaller population. Mind you, they're closer to North America than we are. But as much as half the price of what we're paying in St. Lucia compared to what they're paying in St. Kitts. So something is inherently wrong. And I think we need to take a very serious look as to how we're going to address that going forward. Because I think, um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a preoccupation. Whenever we go to cabinet, the first words out of the prime minister is people. Well, we pray, and then he says people. And the last words out of his mouth before he dismisses us is to remind us that we're here to serve people. So it is something that we take very seriously, and we're trying whatever we can to address it. Yes? Yes? Thank you very much for your time this morning. Remember, wallets and cameras. <laughs> Thank you very much. Today I just want to deal with one issue, um, well, two issues. One, the, we can focus on some of the data on tourism arrivals um, for last year. So you will notice um, the increase in arrivals. Um, I'm not one who believe that you really measure tourism by the um, numbers alone, but I think some people have sought to make the numbers a critical um, issue. Uh, from the data that you would have before you, you would notice for 2023, we registered an increase of 7% for 
over 2022. And of course, we don't have 2021 figures there, but 2021 was the start of the recovery um, in the post-COVID era. Uh, we're still not yet at 2019 figures, which were the um, highest still over arrivals on record. 2019 was a record year for global tourism as well as regional and national tourism. And across you know, all regions, um, we witness, um, like I said, not just in St. Lucia, but every Caribbean country, just about every country in the world, witnessed significant increases in 2019. Um, you will notice that during the summer, we actually had a soft period, and a lot of that had to do not with demand, but availability of flights and seats to St. Lucia, which is why we worked extra hard to ensure that this summer we got some more um, seats available to St. Lucia. And therefore, our numbers were affected during the summer. We were down almost about 11,000 arrivals um, during the summer. Um, you will notice by region, the Caribbean still um, a, a challenge for us. And we're certainly hoping to see um, even better um, numbers moving forward. Um, I haven't given you all the, the pages. I just wanted to give you the stay over arrivals by month to show you um, the the changes that have actually taken place. Feel free to... We've seen an increase in Europe, France, um, the Dark region, and in Canada and the Caribbean as well, right? Is that what I'm seeing there? The silver I was my market. Um, no, but that's only for the month of December for regions. I'll have to give you another page to show you the regions for the, for the entire year. But that one is just for December. Okay, okay. but I, I'm seeing that we took a hit. I mean, our two biggest markets, the US and the UK market in December. Were there any reason for that in particular? Um, you notice the UK and the, the US. I think the, the closure of St. James Club has affected us. Um, and the, the increase, 2022 um, was a, a real um, strong year for us out of the US. And for 2023, we were even better than 2019, which was the previous best, um, if you notice, um, even better than 2019. And 2019 was the best year. Last year was really good for the US for us. Um, and this year, and I think I've indicated in an earlier discussion, we'll have even more challenges if room stock, because um, a number of hotels will close down. Um, Starfish, Mystic, um, will close um, the St. James Club, which will become Secret St. Lucia, will not open until late in the season. So we'll have almost a thousand rooms out of stock, um, which will be a significant um, blow for us. But we, we're hoping and certainly planning to do some aggressive marketing to drive more traffic to the home accommodation sector to take up some, some of the slack. But it is a challenge we'll have over the next two to three years um, until the new hotels actually come on stream. So Secrets will come on stream next year. The Casaba Beach Club will come on stream um, in the next season. Um, Canals hopefully will come on stream um, next winter season. Um, so we will face those, those, those challenges. But at least for next, last year, you would see a 7% increase over 2022. Um, so we continue to improve. And the biggest market challenge for us right now is still the Caribbean market, um, which is significant. I can probably get the relevant page mm -hmm. to show you region for the entire year, as I guess just December, which is what is stated there. With the decrease in room stock, are we projecting a decrease then in silver arrivals for 2024? We actually not. We still expect in 2024 to have an increase. Um, you know, but we're hoping to drive a lot more traffic um, in home accommodation and even existing hotels to ensure that the occupancy levels remain very high throughout the, the, the year.
So the, the, since there is um, a slight issue with accommodations, is there an incentive for people who may want to move into Airbnb? Yeah, I mean, the, the government, certainly for the community tourism agency, we have both grants and loans available for St. Lucians who want to add um, rooms to their home and to be part of the home accommodation um, sector. Of course, you would have to sign in to the community tourism program for you to do so. The new legislation which we will introduce tomorrow, which um, I'll speak of next, will actually offer more incentives to St. Lucians um, to get involved in the home accommodation sector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the other highlight for us for this week um, will be the presentation of the tourism development um, bill tomorrow. Um, it will probably be one of the most far-reaching pieces of legislation introduced in St. Lucia for many years. Um, the aim of the Tourism Development um, Act, which will be debated tomorrow, is for us to reimagine and to re um, design, restructure the tourism industry. We want to build a tourism industry that is inclusive, resilient, and su sustainable. It has to be inclusive because we want more and more St. Lucians to participate in the tourism sector. As it stands now, the legislative framework that provides incentives for people to enter the tourism industry is towards the accommodation sector only. And even in the accommodation sector, it is biased towards all inclusives and large-scale investments. So it does not really cater to, for St. Lucians who want to add two or three rooms to their, their home and be part of the home accommodation sector. In fact, it's for hotels, and a hotel is defined as more than six rooms. It also focuses on the home accommodation sector. So the other sectors in the industry, those solutions are most likely to be part of, it does not cater for them. The new legislation tomorrow will be one that is, all, that is inclusive. It offers greater benefits for St. Lucians who want to enter into the tourism industry across all sectors. So it means now incentives are available across all sectors. And of course, it makes it easier for, for our locals, for them to be able to qualify for incentives to enter the tourism industry. So it will be a more inclusive piece of legislation and the industry itself to be more inclusive. It's going to be more resilient because we are introducing incentives and policy measures that will pro build an industry that can adapt and that can rebound far quicker should there be any setback or challenge facing the industry. COVID taught us that we had to be more adaptive and that we had to be flexible and able to respond to whatever challenges it faced. And tomorrow we'll be providing for the bill specific measures that will aim to do so. And it's going to be more sustainable. Again, there will be um, incentives and provisions for participants in the tourism industry to build a tourism industry that is sustainable in terms of the environment, the use of green energy, the use of green water management, um, and other you know, sustainable environmental practices, but also sustainable from the point of view of saying to developers that for you to get incentives, you have to be able to commit yourself to certain principles. So whereas in the past, when a developer or anybody who invests in the industry can apply for 100% incentives, waivers on taxes, duties, um, across the board. We do not start at 100%. It's really a base of 50. And you will gain additional incentives based on your commitment and demonstration of that commitment to certain principles. Paying your staff higher salaries, more training of staff, um, your commitment to sustainable environmental practices, um, so there will be a number of principles that I will outline tomorrow that once somebody enters the industry, commits themselves to that, they will then qualify to get more incentives. So we're going to incentivize commitment to those fundamental principles we believe are essential for building um, a more inclusive and more resilient tourism industry. So tomorrow, um, I, I really want to encourage everyone to listen to the debate, the presentation of the bill, and to listen to the debate, because we are going to change the entire legislative framework 
that oversees the tourism industry. I want to ask you two questions um, it is related to your portfolio as the Minister for Information. The first one is that we've seen a lot of legislation passed since the entry of this administration, even the previous one. Um, the Freedom of Information Bill for the media, which helps us with our work. When can we see this bill finally come to Parliament? Um, I cannot tell you. Um, well, I mean, we're presenting the tourism bill tomorrow, um, so I'm sure we'll come wrong to, to present it. To, to be honest with you, um, we've not had any sustained discussion at a ministry level on the Freedom of Information Act. Um, we have been discussing the Information Act, the Information Broadcasting Act generally, it's something we inherited from the last government, and we've been doing, we've had a review of it. We've spoken to a number of stakeholders who have commented on it, and it is still being reviewed. And I think we, we are going to, um, within that context, deal with the issue of the freedom of information. So it's on our radar, but I cannot give you a date to tell you it's in three months or six months, but we are. In fact, the last discussion I participated in as minister was um, for us to get a consultant who will do a final review of it so it can go to cabinet for approval. Okay, second question, the, what is the protocol in terms of communicating to the public um, whenever the Prime Minister is not on island? Um, I think that the, the protocol is the press secretary um, issues a, a public statement that the Prime Minister um, is not in country and who is um, holding on and when he's expected to return and where he's going. Um, I'm not sure whether that has changed, but that normally is... Um I'm asking because the Prime Minister has left the country twice in the past two weeks and uh, there is no information coming to the media to inform oh, the public okay. about it. So I don't know if the protocol has changed. No, not that I know of. I'm, and I can't comment so much on that. I'm sure you all know who to ask that question. <laughs> In your portfolio as Minister for Culture, I'm not too sure if, if you are directly associated with it, but I, I know that independent celebrations are moving to Sufre this year. Yes. Um, any reason that you know for the move? And um, if there is a reason, what, 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 how are the plans coming along for in the okay. independent celebrations? Well, first of all, I think you should lend me that bow tie you have there so I can do it. Um, secondly, um, I, I think we wanted to decentralize the celebrations um, for independence. Um, there is that constant refrain that everything is centered around Castries and the North, meaning Grosely and, and Castries. And we felt it necessary for us to continue decentralizing you know, the celebration. So Sofre was chosen this year. I'm not sure where it will be chosen next year. Um, but all in an effort to, to, to spread as much as possible the, the celebrations. Of course, sometimes when you leave and go to some of the other communities, you have different challenges in terms of venue, in terms of movement of people, whatnot. But um, from all that I have heard, the arrangements are proceeding smoothly, and we expect to have a fantastic celebration in Sofre. Um, there'll be the flag raising Wednesday night in a number of communities, view for Denry, Sofre, Castries. We have the military parade um, the morning in Sufre and the, the rally and cultural presentations later on in the day at Sufre. Um, the only, you know, concern I've heard so far is the question of heat because the artificial surfaces generate a lot of heat during the day. And I can tell you, it will not be easy for the police officers and all persons involved. Or if the sun is out full steam on first day, it will be a very hot day. Um, but from all other aspects, from what I'm hearing, it's really going to be a fantastic celebration. Could you still um, expect a, a fireworks display in Castries, or what, how would that work? Yes, I, I think there will be fireworks everywhere. Um, thing. We're also going to have as our, on, our guest of honor um, the president of Guyana, President Ali, who is going to be coming in on Wednesday, and he will be our guest. There will be a special seating of parliament um, you know, on, on Wednesday 
for he is coming in on Tuesday, sorry, he's coming in tomorrow, and there'll be a special sitting of parliament on Wednesday where he will address a joint sitting of parliament. And he will be meeting with his nationals. He will also attend the celebrations on Thursday in Sufre. Um, and of course, there are the niceties of the cocktails and everything else that comes with that. Um, but we are delighted to have the president of Guyana, Sir Lucia, who's quite a few fellow CARICOM citizens, um, Guyanese who have served us well in various sectors, teaching, nursing, um, and other areas. Guyana also hosts quite a lot of St. Lucians, you know, from the 50s, the 60s. So we have a very strong relationship between Guyana and St. Lucia, and the presence of the president of Guyana is a statement of the closeness between our two, um, our two countries and the bond that we share. Gentlemen and ladies of the press, lady, only one lady today. Good morning, good afternoon. What can I help you with this morning? I have a couple of questions. You have, you have a couple, I like your bow tie. Thank you very much, sir. You remind me, remind me of a fellow called George Mallet, you know? <laughs> You're probably too young to know George Mallet. I know the name, sir. You know the name, George Mallet was a prolific politician. He never lost his seat. He was a parliamentary rep for Central Castries. He obviously wore a bow tie. He was a very prolific politician. Not the type, some of the type we have now in, in, in the UWP. A very congenial politician. Very nice guy, actually. Is, I, <clears throat> when I was in opposition, he actually used to give me, talk to me, give me hints as a young politician. His office used to be, um, I used to work, I used to have an office in Riverside Road, and he used to live half the road. And, very, very different to what's happening now. Okay. Very different. All right, sir. Um, I'd like to start off positively. Um, when the independent um, spirit, uh, speak to the importance of fostering national pride. I see a lot of initiatives being put forth by the government. Um, speak to the importance of that in general. But you see, it's the 45th anniversary of our independence. And it's a time when we really should be, we have to unify the country. You know, this country only has 180,000 people. And whether we like it or not, politicians are temporary. And I always made a point that being a, being a prime minister is a temporary job, and I treat it like a temporary job. So there is no need for us to have all this rank and all this. At least for some time in the year, let us enjoy and love St. Lucia. There is nothing is that is better than a country united around something. I was in Grenada for Grenada's 50th anniversary celebrations, and Eric Geary was given the treatment that he deserved as the first prime minister of Grenada. Maurice Bishop was also acclaimed. So the time came, the time comes in the country's history when you have to forget the self, the selfishness of the person and be a bigger person, be a big, be, be a statesman. I think that's the best time for it. That's the time when you reach out and you, you enjoy it. Because, you know, St. Lucia has got many good things happening. When I see the, the, the students, when I see what's happening in the youth economy, when I see what's happening with the young, the, young, the young people in the country, I went to sports awards on Saturday. 2023 was the best year for sports in St. Lucia, all up to this last weekend, the women's cricket, the women's cricket, the senior women's cricket team, they won both the 20 over, the first time in St. Lucia's history. Many things are happening. But if we, 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 we believe that we can only for political gain, just because of the negativity, and negativity we're not going anywhere because it's a temporary job. It's a temporary job. All of us will be there and leave. But the country remains, you guys remain. So I think it's a time when we're supposed to be unified. We're supposed to be preaching um, um, togetherness. We're supposed to be dealing with building our nation, at least for independence, if not forever. Should be forever active. But not forever. Yeah. You recently mes met with the Russian ambassador to St. Lucia. Um, could you tell me about the nature of that meeting and what exactly? Well, he paid a, he, the Russian ambassador paid me a courtesy call. The day before, the American ambassador paid me a courtesy call. And the day before, another ambassador, it, it, it was a usual call by a new ambassador. There was nothing extraordinary about it. It was a, the normal 
call that ambassadors, when they are accredited to the country, they pay that visit. There was nothing extraordinary about that one. Okay, and, and no um, indication of specific discussions? No general discussions. He, he offered scholarships. Because you know the government's position of one university per graduate, we we maintain that your your he said that some students could get scholarships to study in Russia could could happen, and the same same way the, the the American ambassador spoke about these these things. Then we we spoke to the American ambassador about the help as far as our national security is concerned. We had good discussions with both ambassadors because St. Lucia is taking a position where we nobody can determine our friends. We are friends to, to the United States. We are friends with Taiwan. This is our position. We, we the, the Sinusha government is in the foreign policy position that we choose our friends, and that's what we, we, we do. Um, Mr. Pien, on the same independence activity, I notice we have a lot of emphasis now on the battery. You know, it's gone out to the communities, people who fought, you know, were undesirable. I didn't say undesirable. But in the, in the uh, you know, rough sections well, of the community are coming out. How, how pleased are you to see that this initiative has blossomed and more people getting into well, it? Well, the battle really is another manifestation of, 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 of how you can get a nation to, to get into the nation. It, it, it's a kind of a, a, a battle of continuity. You come from the entire, the entire constituents, all the constituencies, they, get, they, they have a day. And the battle carries the carry things against back to Kashi. Again, it's a manifestation of oneness, a manifestation of unity, a manifestation of, of togetherness. Each constituency have the, the different ways of, 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 the, of doing it. Some constituencies are more elaborate than others, but the fact is the theme is togetherness, continuity, togetherness, and basically love for country, love for nation. Um, last week, I think Ras Aipo, he spoke about <clears throat> an issue that Sinusha Lucia is having where there is a, even though the population is not increasing, he has seen that the, the number of vendors has dramatically increased from, pre from previous years. And he's saying that, that as of right now, he, 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 he doesn't want Sinusha to become a nation of only vendors. And he's saying that a lot of the people, they're not genuine vendors. They turn to the, the vending career as a, a way of just making a, any type of money they can. So could you speak about that, like the issue? And you said this is a, an upcoming issue that Senator will have to face eventually. So do you talk about that? Well, um, Mr. Iper is a leader of the vendors, so he's best placed to speak about them. Um, what I think is that, you know, whether we want to believe it or not, the economy of the country is, is, is expanding. The economy is, is expanding. I mean, we've had the Chamber of Commerce has said that the businesses did better in 2023. So people see opportunity, and they believe that the best opportunity is vending. <laughs> you know, I, I think, I wish it could have been different, but that, that's how people see it. Because of the opportunity that exists, the economy is expanding. Businesses are making more money. You know, people are making, so people be the want to exchange. So, so people want to exchange, people want to buy and sell, which is the fastest way of doing it. But there's got to be some order. There's got to be some discipline in, in the vending. But they also, we also need to look at our skills. Because I'm saying to you, next year, with the boom in construction, both the private construction sector, and you're going to hear these things in the policy statement. When you talk about the year of infrastructure, people think it's only roads. It's not roads. The infrastructure is, is buildings, the public sector investment program. Not only roads. You, 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 you're going to see our housing initiatives. You're going to see the, the government initiated as far as the, 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 the public sector is concerned, the House of Justice, the police stations. You're going to see in the private sector, you're going to see hotels. Investments come, investments come all the day, every day. Investments come for people wanting to make parts of the country special uh, uh, development areas so they can build and expand. So the economy is expanding, and you'll see it for, for, for yourself. So people now, but I, I hope that they could, learn, they could learn some skills instead of vending. I really hope so, but skills take, take time. And then we have, to be, we have to do something about the construction industry. We've got to find a way, and I've been discussing with, 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 with my colleagues, particularly the, the Prime Minister of Barbados, to do something in the construction industry. So whether we could see we can get some people to get short-term training in, in, in the construction industry. But um, the reason why you find that influx of vendors, because... People see more opportunity, and people see the, the economy is expanding. But there needs to be some control. 
of, of the vendor situation. Not, not to displace them, but to cause some level of control. And I really hope that politicians don't get involved to make the matter seem political. It's not political. You, you said opportunity, but um, I believe for the, I can't speak for Vendor or Wool, but in the boulevard that I'm talking about, um, I know Cicely, I think her name is, she said that, uh, she's a president, she said that the vendors are not even seeing much profit there right now. So would you be able to? I, you know, well, I don't, I can't get involved in, in, in in people's opinions. I rather don't get involved in somebody. That's people's opinions. People have opinions about anything. I don't, I, I'm not getting involved in their opinions because some, some you heard another friend that said how they, they did very well. So that's opinions. Everybody has an opinion. That's the beauty, beauty of our democracy. You have kind of opinion for everything. Yes. Okay, Prime um, Minister. Um, um, last week you went to the, the House and there have been some talk about the 2.5%. I'm glad you said so. Yes. You know, because, you know, <laughs> you know, I really laughed at this. And you, I, I found it funny. You won't, you didn't come in that yet because, in fact, that was what I was, I was, I was expecting. You know, because you know, I tell you something. Eh? The, the, the the problem with with with, with, with Saint Lucia is people forget the history. People forget what has happened before. You would have believed that is the first time Saint Lucia had a uh, Saint Lucia had a. Uh, PBL, a policy-based loan. You think it's the first time that never happened before? The last government went into into PBLs also, and every B PBL has a prerequisite. I want you to I want you to listen to it carefully. Every PBL has a prerequisite. Okay, now let's look at it logically. Before we jump into the before we jump into the into the the the, the, the emotion and and uh, and what sounds good, let's jump, let's look at it logically. Logically, we have a loan from. You must listen. Listen, listen to me. Listen. You see, you shouldn't listen that now. You don't listen to me. You're going to get diverted by the noise when when the noise comes on comes out again. Because you see, what I'm the so you see, you get you, all, you get diverted by noise. You understand? Reality and truth. We have went to the, to the Caribbean Development Bank for a loan. Listen to what a loan is. The one of the loans is land administration. All the governments in this country, they acquired land from people. They did not pay them. Not our fault, not their fault. Land was acquired and the payments were not made. 6% statutory interest when you owe people for their land. 6%. 6%. The government went to the CDB and made a case. It's called a policy-based loan. A policy has to underpin it. The policy was we owe that money for land acquisition. We want to put it in order. The interest is 6%. So what can you do for us? Gentlemen, it's a policy-based loan, so you have to have what is called prior conditions. Conditions which the last government had to do when they got their policy-based loan. It's not the first time you have policy-based loans in the country. One of the conditions is you have to enhance revenue, revenue enhancement. I want you to follow it very slowly. That loan is repayable in 40 years. It starts in 40 years. With a grace period, I think, of five, five years. So there is no payment on the loan for five years. So, first condition, you must have revenue enhancement. Revenue enhancement means you must collect more revenue. The government comes up and listen to me. We need to get revenue for health and security. So we're going to pass a 2.5 levy, which will enhance revenue, but will be used for health and security. Very simple. So the revenue is going to be enhanced, but the 2.5% is going to be used for health and security. There is no secret in that. It's a revenue enhancing measure. But we need, okay, how would you improve the health and security in this country if it already is revenue? 
how would you pay for St. Jude? How would you pay for the, for, for the, the House of Justice? How would you pay for the, new, for, for the new police stations? You need to raise revenue. How could you have universal health care? You need to raise revenue. So the revenue that we want to raise comes to the health and security levy. So to juxtaposition that against a loan you have to pay in 40 years, starting in 10 years' time, where is the logic? We never said that you would have put $1.50 on gas and put it in the lockbox. We never said so. And so people must remember that. We were we was straight. We said the money is going to go in the consolidated fund. And that's where we put it. And we came and we said how much money had been, had been collected for the health and security levy up to, the, I think, up to um, December or something. So. We said so. It was a public statement. The Minister of Finance never said it was going to be in a lockbox. He said it's going to be in the, in the consolidated fund. So all the you and cry about fooling people. I, I don't know why is that coming in. Why is that? I don't understand. Somebody explains to me why is that coming in. I don't know. It's a revenue enhancing measure that we did. How would you fund health and security? I want to answer your question. How would you fund universal health care? How would you fund what's happening, in fact, as far as St. Jude is concerned? And very soon I'll bring you to see what's happening in St. Jude. You'll see real, real development in construction in St. Jude. I'll take, I'll take you on a tour with me if you want to come. Very, very soon, yes. Okay, um, we're going to take a slow because I want to understand what you're saying here. Mm -hmm. um, Please, we need to understand. <laughs> the health and security levy, mm -hmm. as you said, um, this was not sparked, the idea for this was not sparked by the World Bank's um, conditions for the policy based loan. It was not. No. A revenue, and a revenue enhancing measure, and health and security is a revenue enhancing measure which would be used for health and security. The, the, the operative word is revenue enhancement. Okay. That's the operative word. Okay, so they, they needed you to, as one of the conditions for that policy based loan, you needed to raise more revenue. Yes. And you chose the health and security. So the health and security levy did come about because then of that? No. We could have done anything else. We could have raised VATs. We could have raised licenses. We could have raised anything. But it wanted to be specific because the issues as related to health and security. But then is the opposition's argument not valid that? In the initial um, introduction of this um, this levy, it was said that it was yes, it, indeed it is. It is as you said, it was it is specific so, for so, for so. health and for security. Um, but what they're saying is, in addition to that, the whole idea for this, the reason why we even have a health and security levy is because the World Bank, Caribbean Development Bank, well, yeah, Caribbean Development Bank required that no. you raise revenue no. and you chose this? We chose to enhance revenue by imposing health and security levy to fund health and security. Because how would you fund health and security if you did not raise revenue? How would you do it? And we choose to do it by the health and security levy. But they didn't tell us to have health and security levy. They asked to enhance revenue. And we choose health and security. I think we understand that. What I'm yeah. saying is that this was the option you, you chose. Yeah. You chose that option as part mm -hmm. of the, the um, what was asked of you. Uh -huh. Yeah. But not that they themselves said, okay, you know what, you have to do this. Mm -hmm. I think we understand that. Um, what other revenue raising activity yeah. came out of this? No. I'll tell you what I'm, And you see, and I invite, always invite you to come to the parliament to listen. Here's what else we did. Here we did. We had a Public Debt Management Act, which right now the government, the Minister of Finance will come to the government and listen to me. Parliament said this is the debt that we raised and why we raised it. That's another condition. And that's a very good question because we, we, is, there, were, there were six prior, prior, prior policy direct, um, initiatives we had to take. One, we had to enhance legislation related to public debt management. So the government had to come through cabinet to have a public debt management act. We had to have approved the annual publication of the medium term debt strategy starting in 2023, consistent to the policy framework of the public debt management act. That's next, the second priority. The third priority, we have approved the public procurement regulations 
to promote and enforce the new Public Procurement Act. The last government passed the Public Procurement Act as part of a policy-based loan. But they didn't have the, 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 I don't use the word, to pass the regulations to it. The, 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 the other strategy is public finance management regulations to promote and enforce the Public fin Finance Management Act. The last government passed the Public Finance Management Act. They don't want to pass it, but we have now we put in the regulations. The other one is a national energy policy to promote the renewable energy and energy efficiency. And the other one is the government had to pass a climate change bill, which you saw in the parliament yourself. And the other one is the Insolvency Act. Now, here's what's important in the Insolvency Act. The only reason why we have not passed the Insolvency Act is we want to protect homeowners in that what you want to see is if someone has their own home, their home where they're raising their family, we want to protect it so a bank can come and seize it if times go bad. That's, that's, what, that's, a, government, that's a principle that the government stands by. That's, but the bankruptcy and insolvency bill already has its first reading. We're looking at how we can refine the homeowners thing so, they win, so if you go into hard times, uh, the bank can come and seize your house. Just so. That's why we haven't passed it yet. But the first reading is had. And the second one is to improve MSME's access to finance and expand the time of collateral for MSME's. The government approved the Security Interest in Movable Property Act, where you can use other things for assets if you have a small business. And the last government started that, actually. And we continued. But they started it. Because they knew that to get a public a, a PBL, you had to have these these pre-existing conditions. So it wasn't only one, it's several. The tax administration bill is not part, it's, it's part of this it's as well. Now, mm -hmm. the last time you and I had a discussion, you, you, were, you, were, very, <laughs> you, were, very, you were very emotional about the, the tax enhancement bill. And, 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 and well, I'm very happy you've, you've got the facts now and you seem to have understood that. I'm very happy. It's, it's always good to have discussion and, and, and things. So, so when, when, when our emotions climb, and then we, we, we level, we understand the truth, right? Here's what happened to the public, to the Income Tax Act. There were 16 laws relating to income tax, certain or 16. I'll just repeat it again, because people seem to have forgotten. The last government instructed the Ministry of Finance to put these together. They put together. In that, they have one bill to deal with VAT, all the other taxes. But in the interest of the government's revenue, because why does anybody fool you? The government needs revenue to, re to run a country. The government can't run a country only on, 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 on taxation. They need revenue. They need revenue, and revenue, some revenue comes through taxation. So taxation is an is a important part of a government's public finance policy. Taxation. None of us like taxes. But it's a serious fund. You have to raise revenue for a country. You raise revenue directly or indirectly. Directly for, for tax, indirectly for VAT, etc. So what the CDB was saying to us, listen to me, you need to get your tax administration done properly. The equipment you have out there is outdated. You must have had issues with, 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 with your tax. You can't get how much tax you owe. You can't get it. So they said this to me, we are going to lend you some money to reorganize your inner revenue department by using technology. And, it, and we're going to lend that money. And hopefully, when you raise that money, your inner revenue is operating more efficiently. Records are easier to get. You will be able to attract more revenue. Revenue out there that you're not taking because your systems are key. And as we move more towards indirect taxation, that's going to happen more. Like the health and security levy, like VAT, that's where, that's where the world is moving to, indirect taxation, apart from give people their money and let them spend it. So when you move into indirect taxation, your systems need to be better. And that's why that's the other part of the loan. Yes. Um, <laughs> given the fact that, um, as you said, it was to raise revenue for specifically by health and security, I know the initial, the, the, the end of this levy is in 2025, somewhere in 2025. Initial. Yeah. 
Will we see a continuation of I this movie? I know you all like to say I'm not I'm not a prophet. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, okay. Um, thanks on another um, issue, original issue. There have been some concerns. The president of the Dominican Republic has warned about Haiti on the brink of civil war. Um, and said it could affect the region. Are you concerned about what are you concerned about? Um, of course we are, for many reasons. Um, well, that's why the former Prime Minister Saint Lucia is on the on the on the eminent persons group to help you. The, the Haitian situation is very complicated, very very complicated. I mean, it's it, 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 it's historical, it's it's strategic. It's because he sees Haiti is one of the richest countries in the world in terms of resources, in terms of what the capability of Haiti. Heat is some of the world's um, rarest minerals. You understand? But Haiti is very complicated, very complicated situation. Solutions have been tried many times, but the problem is the Haitian people are clamoring to run their own affairs. But the, situ the situation in Haiti is complex, and solutions are not easily found, have not been easily found, and will not be easily found. It's a very complex situation, extremely complex. And yes, I'm concerned for several reasons. Yeah, but uh, you think that the, the um, Caribbean leaders should be, be more involved in trying to get some kind of solution? Caribbean leaders are involved. In fact, Caribbean are very involved. But Caribbean leaders are limited in terms of the resources that they, they can put in into Haiti. And I think that, 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 that that's a question in terms of resources. OK, another question for me. With recent time, with a number of um, crime, we're talking about crime in St. Lucia and Haiti. What we have seen is a number of nationals, including Venezuelans and Colombians, being arrested. Be, um, some of them, uh, well, they have been transported. Are, are there strong links? But we've always said that we have porous borders. Eh? We've always said so. We have, we have porous borders. Again, resources. You saw the fantastic display by the Marine. The, the Marine Police this morning. They need more resources. As things level, the health and security levy will be used to, to, to get money to fund the Marines. Resources. You see, the question, gentlemen, is resources. Everybody has solutions. Nobody says, how do you get the resources to fund these solutions? Resources. That's a, big, that's a big question. We need, re, we need resources. And we have to resources, human resources, in terms of people's intelligence, people's time, people volunteering, but you also need material resources. And that is what we are working to get, material resources, to add to the human resources that are in place. Yeah, I thought that's uh, just Saturday. We have up to um, 14 homicides. Um, one of the big things coming out from the streets and everybody is uh, this influence of gang related six and seven. What can you tell you? I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. I made that point several times before. There is nobody in their right senses who likes violence. There is nobody who, who, who should clamor about violence or repeat the same things because they believe that somebody will, will, will get hurt. Some politician will get affected. There, there's, you know, if there was an easy solution to the situation, I'll be the first person to deal with it. Like with all my colleagues, every head of government, and we're going to CARICOM next week, their problem is violence. We were in Trinidad year before last. Violence as a public health issue. So there's no easy solution. Anyone who pretends there's an easy solution is basically being disingenuous. There is no easy solution to this problem. You think I want to hear there are murders in this country, young lives being lost? You understand? But the question is, we, I cannot sit down and pontificate I have to ask for advice. I have to ask for people to stop making it sensational. And I have to ask 
for people to be matured in the in the expressions about the violent situation in this country. That's all I'm asking for. It's not easy. Why do you think? Why do you think we? I would like to have. Why even the opposition would like to have 14 murders in this country? They wouldn't like to have it. No one would like to. But the solutions are complex. And the solutions can't be found by just talking and criticizing. It's a complex situation with many, many, many areas of, 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 of concern. The, the violent situation in Stalin St. Lucia on, on the 26th of July, it has been there all the time. Crime has been something that's, that's been, there seems to be a, 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 a cancer that's in all the, 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 the countries in the region. And that is not any source of comfort when I say in all countries in the region, but it's a fact. And we have to face it and try our best by all means necessary within the law to build it to to to. On the on the topic of crime, um, to bring up someone else's opinion again, because I think Dennis Springer spoke about how um, one of the deterrents would be to as the I think the death penalty is still on the books, the reinstatement of that or, or other forms of police escalation. Could you provide your thoughts on that? The death penalty is outlawed in Europe. Okay? And many countries they align their, their help for you with the death penalty. Many countries. You have to, you have to make a decision. And by the way, the death penalty has not been outlawed in St. Lucia. You know that? Mm -hmm. It's in the books. Yes. It has not been outlawed in St. Lucia. So what's your so you don't think it should be used? Like what's your? I know. If I see that you, the, the, the opposition will say, I say I don't know, <laughs> because the opposition want want me to be a judge now. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you what 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 the, the, the opposition would like me. They like me to make an Atlantic statement, like Kenny can do it, I can. That's what they want me to do, make an Atlantic statement. But I'm not going to do that. I am too. I, I, I am not. I, I don't. I am not moved. I'm focused. They want to make outlandish statements. You know how they quote outlandish statements? Like there was a minister who said, um, "Leave my boys alone." They love me to say that. They will love me to say that. You know that's what the opposition wants. And they're not going to get it from me. So they can try and try and try. They're not. I am not going to make any outlandish statement about crime. I'm not going to make it. So they can criticize me. They can say I'm not a police. They can say that doesn't, that, that does nothing to me. Absolutely nothing to me. I'm focused. I'm focused. And that's what I'm going to do. So, my good friend, when you speak to them, tell them don't try. They can say whatever they want about me. I am not going to make any outlandish statement about crime. Never. I'm not going to do it. So they can well get off that, 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 that habit. That's what they want me to do. You know, you see that, you heard what the, what the, leader, what the leader of the said, Kenny can't stop it, I can. And you, what happened to him? <laughs> what, what, what happened to him? So he liked me to be in that boat, not me. I know, <laughs> I know, I know good that boat at all. So they can try and try and try. You know, I have a thick skin. I, I, I am focused. I understand where I came from, I know where I'm going. I have a vision for St. Lucia. I, I, I want to know, I know I want to take this country. I want the help of everybody to take this country. So I'm not going to get sidestepped by, by, by emotion and misinformation. And, and that don't bother me. You, I mean, all the Facebook, all the, the, the media, media images and these things. In fact, I don't even look at them. You know, you know the, late, the late Sir John Compton, he says that he doesn't read the newspapers or listen to, to the news. And, and my friend, um, Rick Wayne, used to quote him all the time in, and say to him that the John Cummings says that doesn't, doesn't listen to the newspapers, listen to the news, right? That is the thing. I don't listen to Facebook. I don't watch it. So I don't see United Park and things. So, mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so, so these things are not, are not for me. I don't look at United Park and I don't look at that. People tell me about it. So no matter what they say there, or what they do there has nothing to do with me. I'm focused. I'm focused, and the, and the results of my 
been focused, have been seen. I want to go and see what's happening in the youth economy. $20 million in there. You saw the exhibition of young people and people on, in, in, the, in Constitution Park. You saw it. You saw the reports in the Chamber of Commerce. You're going to hear about the hotels, the new hotels going to be built. That's what I'm focused on, not the, the, the noise. Um, Prime Minister, um, Dr. Kenny Anthony made some statements in the House relating to um, the oh. management of uh, funds. Um, oh, what? Of loans when we get loads from certain entities and how outside entities like the, with the OECS um, skills no, this, project. Yeah, that's what I said, OECS skills project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what are your thoughts on Dr. Dr. Kenny Anthony has made it clear that he expresses his opinion and I welcome his opinion. Dr. Kenny Anthony, I worked with him for 15 years. Um, he was my Prime Minister. I have great respect for him. I have great respect for his opinion, and his opinion, I, I value it, and if there's anything I can do based on his, an expression of his opinion, I will do it. I have absolutely no issues with Dr. Ant with Dr. Anthony sitting in his mind. I have absolutely no issues with that. That is what the parliament ought to be. The parliament ought to be a place not to walk out. It's supposed to be a place where you sit in there and, 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 you, and you discuss ideas. And Dr. Anthony has said he's a backbencher. He's expressing ideas. I have no, absolutely no problem with that. In fact, I welcome the suggestions he made. Is Dr. Anthony made a point that these regional bodies should not be handling our, 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 our loans. Um, I think that there are, certain, there are circumstances where it should be, some where it shouldn't be not. There is no hard and fast rule. Because you see, these things, we would like to have a perfect, a perfect world, but the world is not perfect. And many times, you want to do whatever you, you want to do, but the person who is putting the money dictates what you have to do. So you have to make a choice, whether you want to take it on their terms or compromise. But Dr. Anthony's opinion is well on this. I'm just one last thing. Yes. So on the crime issue, you know, the step of the domestic violence bill, more, more fines for, for possession of ammunition, and we, we've been to the CCG. Now, in terms of the death penalty, would that be something along the line that to reform? Because, I mean, it will be important some stage to be, when you're going to... Wait, but wait now, it's still in the books. books now. In fact, um, very soon we're going to, we are going to announce the parliamentary review, the parliamentary review committee on the Constitution of St. Lucia. That's going to be very soon. So we're going to be looking at it because we, are, we started with the Deputy Speaker and I hope you saw the value of a Deputy Speaker last, last sitting. If, 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 if like times before, the, the, there would have been no sitting because there's no Deputy Speaker. But I hope you saw the value of a Deputy Speaker last sitting. The sitting went on the Deputy Speaker. And that is, is, these are the little things that distinguish our government. That's, these are the things that, that, people, that people must understand, the difference between us. We had the fortitude to say to an elected member, you cannot be a minister, you've got to be deputy speaker. And that is, what, that is what leadership is all about. That's what it's all about. Leadership is all about clip talk and noise. And, and, and th leadership is about taking decisions and, the, and you see the value of a deputy speaker? The last parliament. Although, I must say, about his baptism. <laughs> it wasn't, it was, it was, his baptism, he had a baptism of fire, to use your words. But, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a value. And I think he handled himself very well. He was calm. And I'll tell you something. <clears throat> I just want to make a point, because you, 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 for, for you, for Junior, I want to make a point. There is no law in St. Lucia that says, if you have one or two members of parliament in parliament, you must talk class. There is no law that says so. There is no law. There is absolutely no justification for any man saying, because he is only one or two of them, he must choose when to speak. There is no law. In Barbados, up to last month, there was no opposition. In Grenada, up to last year, there was no opposition. Now, the law of the parliament is who catches the speaker's eye. 
The speaker's eye is the light. So, the idea that I am there alone and these guys want me to speak second or third, this is absolutely irrelevant. The people of St. Lucia chose to put two guys in the parliament. The people. We can't have democracy two ways. Democracy is one way. We go to the ballot and the first past the post system says how many people go to parliament. The, parli the, pe the people of St. Lucia said two of you go into parliament. So when you get there, you are a member of parliament. Your privilege is being able to speak your mind. There is no law that says, because two of you there, you must speak last or first. When I was leader of the opposition, I spoke immediately after. You understand? So, this emotion about, you have to walk out, these guys didn't let me speak, an important bill like that, look at what they're doing me. This is, this is absolute nonsense. Yeah, to, to finish on a, on a more positive note. Yeah, Prime Minister, what's the protocol for when you leave the country in terms of communicating the public? No, when the country, the, the, there's an announcement goes, once I've gone pu public business, everybody knows. No, we were not informed of the last two times. So what did that do? You went to the ECC meeting uh, uh, and also to Grenada for the independence celebration. Yes, there was a petition. There. Mm -hmm. No, there was not. Mm -hmm. There was not. Grenada? Okay. No. Well, let me uh, apologize for my press. But by the country, I there should be a release, yes, it should be. So. Okay. But who informs the press? The press secretary will, will give, give a release. But any time I leave, you know there's an acting prime minister, you know that. I know there's an acting prime minister, I don't know the protocol. The protocol is when I leave, there's a, the, the governor general is written and says the prime minister is leaving. So somebody acts as prime minister and the press informs, the press office in, informs the press. That's it. So let me tell you, early, I'll be going to Guyana next, next Sunday for the heads of government conference. Let me tell you where I'm going. I tell you where I'm going. <laughs> I'm going to Ghana next Sunday for the Heads of Government Conference. I think it's the Heads of 46, I'm the Heads of Government Conference. And then after, I go to St. Vincent for the, for the CELAC meeting, Central American uh, which President, Prime Minister Gonzalez is the chairperson, and I return on the 2nd of March. So I leave on Sunday the 25th, I return on the 2nd of March. Okay? Now, I leave some time ago in, you're going to find out. I go to, to speak to nationals of, of, of Canada. I leave either on the 6th or the 8th of, of, 8th of March. I come back on the 10th. I spend one day in Canada. I've got to come back here to deal with my estimates. I spend one day. And my, my, and my hotel rate is not, is not 2,000 pounds. No. <laughs> That's not my hotel rate. You're like, not too long. Now, you want to be positive? Principal business question? You know, um, patriotism. Patriotism means putting your country first. It means, for me, ensuring that the people of this country, as many as possible, if not all, enjoy a decent standard of quality of life. That's what it means to me. It means understanding our rich history, our heritage, respecting our elders, the contribution of our elders must be respected, and also the contribution of people, what they call unsung heroes, people who make it happen. And there are very many, I mean, when I go to the Donato school, I see unsung heroes there. You know, when I see, the, 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 when I go to the St. Lucie's home, and I go to, to all these children's homes, I see unsung heroes. To me, that is the essence of patriotism, and that's what I admire. So happy independence. See you all, the president of Ghana, 
the president of Ghana is coming. I will see if I can arrange for him to speak to you. Okay. Um, so yeah. Bye-bye. Have a good day.